energy. It is essential for human existence. It provides heat, light, and mobility. But the global energy system, which shapes both energy supply and energy demand, is enormous and complex and ever-changing. The global energy system is also impacted by local diversity and is susceptible to confusion, advocacy, and misunderstanding. Over the last few years, my colleagues and I have tried to make the global energy system more understandable, an approach that we hope will be helpful as people assess their choices and options. Global energy has many aspects, but for this presentation, I will focus on three major trends, population, energy use, and atmospheric levels of carbon dioxide, or CO2. Clearly, CO2 is not the only greenhouse gas. In fact, water vapor is the most prevalent greenhouse gas. Altogether, these greenhouse gases have made our planet more livable, warming the Earth by 60 degrees Fahrenheit, or 30 degrees Celsius. Human activity doesn't impact water vapor very much, but human activity definitely impacts emissions of carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxides, and fluorine gases. And energy is not the only human activity that emits greenhouse gases, as shown on the right. Without question, the emissions of all of these greenhouse gases and human activities need to be better managed. But as you can see, carbon dioxide and energy represent the biggest challenges. The level of CO2 in the atmosphere is a global phenomenon, but climate is a local phenomenon. CO2 levels can be measured daily. Climates are defined over a period of 30 years. Many types of data are involved in describing a climate, and local geographies impact local climates. One can talk about the average change in global temperature, but this is a calculation based on temperature measurements at multiple points across the Earth. These global temperature calculations do give a broad indication of what is going on, but the real temperature impacts are felt by people living in hundreds of local climates. Because of all of these complexities, I've chosen to use atmospheric CO2 levels as a proxy for climate impacts. I'll now turn to the history of global energy. Carbon was present when the Earth was formed four and a half billion years ago. It took a long time for our planet to settle down. There were massive volcanoes which spewed out CO2 and other gases and geologic forces which buried the carbon deep in the earth. These same forces also buried dead plant and animal material, which over time became coal, crude oil, and natural gas. Levels of atmospheric CO2 sometimes were much higher than they are today and sometimes much lower. Our species, Homo sapiens, evolved roughly 200,000 years ago. Early humans were hunter-gatherers, living in small groups, eating plants and animals, and surviving the ice ages. 10,000 years ago, at the end of the last ice age, CO2 levels rose to 280 parts per million, or ppm, and the Earth warmed. There were only 5 million people. The warmer temperatures allowed our ancestors to establish an agrarian lifestyle, which prevailed for thousands of years. Atmospheric CO2 remained fairly stable at roughly 280 ppm, and people continued to rely on plants for their basic energy. And by 1760, the global population had grown to 800 million people. But the global energy system began to change during the 1760s, starting with the invention of the steam engine in Britain. Initially, the fuel of choice was wood, but Britain quickly shifted to coal, which was more plentiful. Before long, there were major advances in the production of industrial materials like steel, cement, and even paper, and acceleration of travel with coal-fired trains. By the mid-1800s, crude oil became an energy fuel followed by electricity, and eventually by natural gas heating. By the early 20th century, the stage was set for fossil fuel dominance, which continues today. Without question, the first half of the 20th century was a challenging time, a worldwide depression and two world wars. But by 1960, developed countries were engaged in economic expansion. And from 1990 onward, developing countries expanded their economies. It was a period of significant innovation. First, to respond to the 1973 Arab oil embargo, 
and as the 20th century closed, to respond to concerns about climate change. This slide shows the long-term trends beginning with the dawn of the Industrial Revolution for population, fossil fuel use, and atmospheric levels of CO2. All of these trends have grown significantly since 1760 and in fact have accelerated over the last 60 years and fossil fuel use grew faster than population. There have been a lot of changes in energy consumption during the course of my own lifetime. Overall, total energy consumption nearly quadrupled. In 1965, the US was the world's largest energy consumer and Germany's energy consumption was higher than China, India, and Sub-Saharan Africa combined. By 2019, China became the world's largest energy consumer and India is number three. Sub-Saharan Africa nearly closed the gap with Germany. On a global basis, 24% of energy is used for transportation and 28% is used to heat, cool, and power buildings. Nearly half of the world's energy is used for industrial production of everything from steel and chemicals to the clothes on your back. 44% of global energy is now delivered as electricity, still mostly powered by fossil fuels. But there is more to the story than just what happened. I'll now turn to the question of why did it happen? There are several themes that drive energy supply and demand, such as people's desire to improve their lives, as well as what people need from their energy. This leads people to prefer some fuels over other fuels, but what actually happens is constrained by the realities of their local context. Let me explain. The world's economic growth has been powered by increasing amounts of energy. Economic development has resulted in better health care, lower infant mortality, and significant increases in life expectancy, plus a wide range of consumer products that have made day-to-day -day life less burdensome. This is not to deny the inequities regarding incomes and health care, nor to deny the excesses of the consumer economy. But it is also hard to deny that, on balance, most people's lives are better than those of their 18th century ancestors. All people have three basic energy needs. They want their energy to be secure and reliable, affordable, and with minimum environmental impacts. But these three needs also lead to plenty of debates, which change over time, about what to do. For example, after the 1973 Arab, Arab oil embargo, U.S. energy security concerns led to oil exploration in the North Sea and development of nuclear power and biofuels. Today's concerns include secure access to the metals required for batteries and renewable energy. Energy affordability concerns have also shifted from price controls on natural gas to subsidies for wind and solar installations. And while most environmental concerns still center on local pollution, local issues now include resistance to new energy installations, regardless of the fuel. Without question, the goal of decarbonization has sparked debates, not only about the pace of reducing fossil fuels, but also about nuclear energy and hydropower, and about how best to deliver and store reliable, renewable energy. This slide shows how countries make different fuel choices. Why the difference? Domestic resources are important. Compared to coal, the U.S. uses more oil and gas because it has these resources in abundance. China and India have a lot of domestic coal, but not much domestic oil and gas. Markets are also important. Neither Germany nor India has much natural gas, but Germany consumes a lot of imported gas supplied by long-standing contracts. India is still catching up. Governments influence fuel choices. The German government committed to going green and now has a high level of, renew of renewable energy. China's government committed to the Three Gorges Dam and now has a relatively high level of hydropower. Domestic institutions and societal conventions also shape energy use. Today, Germans use half as much nuclear energy than they did in 1990. The reason? Public demand after Japan's nuclear disaster in 2011. And of course, technology also plays a role. Today, the U.S. uses half as much coal as it did in 1990. The invention of hydraulic fracturing, better known as fracking, 
turned the U.S. into the world's largest producer of oil and gas. Domestic coal could not compete. These five local factors, institution and conventions, the market system, state policy, technology and resources, all influence each other. And taken together, they directly influence the local energy context and the energy debates and outcomes that occur in each country. What about the trends for the future? How will we provide enough energy in 2050 for a world of 10 billion people? How fast will people change their choices of fuels? And when will the world achieve net zero emissions so that atmospheric levels of CO2 no longer keep rising? I don't have the answer to any of these questions, but I can offer four scenarios that explore how innovation might shape the pace of the energy transition. BP provides forecasts on a number of scenarios. This slide represents a business as expected scenario. It is a scenario of continuous improvement and takes into account more energy efficiency as well as more renewables. On the left, you can see global energy demand. For the developing countries, shown in green, demand is not forecast to grow very much. Almost all of the growth in energy demand is expected to come from the developing countries with their rising populations and rising economies. This slide shows the business as expected forecast for global energy supply, highlighting the different fuels. The forecast is for a significant rise in renewables, but absolute growth in fossil fuel use, leaning to even more CO2 emissions and not a reduction. Put simply, the pace of decarbonization is not fast enough in the business as expected scenario, particularly with 30% more people on the planet. Step change, the second scenario, is about accelerating the pace of innovation within the existing global energy system. An example of step change is Henry Ford's invention of the automobile assembly line, which was much more efficient than a team of workers building one car at a time. The current conversation about getting to net zero emissions is mostly a conversation about step change. The focus is on changing the fuel mix to drastically reduce hydrocarbon emissions. You can see the various elements being considered. Broadly, it's the right program, and all of this will be helpful. But achieving all of these objectives will take time to agree on the rules and regulations, to arrange the financing, to obtain the permits, and to implement the projects. What if step change is not fast enough? Then what? Transformation, the third scenario, seeks to create a whole new global energy system. Transformation occurred in the tra transportation sector with the invention of the internal combustion engine, which put a lot of horse owners out of business. You can see some of the transformational ideas that are being considered. Without a doubt, some big questions will need to be addressed. Transformation will challenge the way we consume energy regardless of which fuel we might be using. And transformation will, will require the evaluation of new technologies and analysis of potential risks. But perhaps now is the time, because the last transformation in the entire global energy system began 260 years ago, in 1760, with the invention of the steam engine. The fourth scenario is reaction. Faced with unavoidable change, most people don't just accept the consequences. They react, they adapt, and they demonstrate their resilience. In short, they innovate. For some, they will explore opportunities, such as Russia's plans for a northern sea route as the Arctic ice cap diminishes. Others will innovate to protect their existing communities by installing seawalls, by rationing water use, and by restricting residential housing in sensitive areas. And some people, like millions before them, will decide that they can no longer stay where they are. They will migrate and then innovate some more as they meet the challenges of their new location. This is my last slide. It should be obvious by now that many choices lie ahead. Some energy choices will surprise us by how well they work. And like every human endeavor, some of our choices are likely to result in unfortunate mistakes. But choose we must.